and thank you for being here. I hope you've all had a chance to look at the budget book. I realize it is a large budget book. J'aimerais d'abord vous faire part de certaines des réflexions qui ont mené à l'élaboration de ce budget et de la stratégie et de l'approche qui le guide. Je serai heureuse de répondre à vos questions par la suite. Les Canadiens et les Canadiennes ont été durement touchés par ce virus. Mais il y a une lumière au bout du tunnel. Nous surmonterons cette crise et nous le ferons ensemble. Comme nous le disons depuis le tout début, nous ferons tout ce qu'il faut pour aider les gens et les entreprises à passer à travers la pandémie. À l'heure actuelle, nous luttons contre une troisième vague, vague agressive du virus. Les mesures de soutien aux entreprises et de revenus seront prolongées jusqu'à l'automne. Les changements à l'assurance-emploi seront en place pour une autre année et un nouveau programme d'embauche sera mis en place. This budget addresses three fundamental challenges. First, we need to conquer COVID. That means buying vaccines and supporting provincial and territorial health care systems. It means enforcing our quarantine rules at the border and within the country. And it means providing Canadians and Canadian businesses with the support they need to get through these tough third-wave lockdowns and to come roaring back when the economy fully reopens. Second, we need to punch our way out of the COVID recession. That means ensuring lost jobs are brought back as swiftly as possible and hard-hit businesses rebound quickly. It means providing support where COVID has hit hardest, to women, to young people, to low-wage workers, and to small businesses, especially in hospitality and tourism. And the final challenge is to build a more resilient Canada, a better, more fair more prosperous, and more innovative Canada. That means investing in the green transition and in the green jobs that go with it, in digital transformation and innovation, and in the infrastructure we need to thrive and grow. And it means providing Canadians with social infrastructure, from early learning and childcare, to student grants, to income top-ups for low-wage workers so the middle class can flourish and more Canadians can join it. Permettez-moi de me pencher sur quelques points que j'estime essentiels. Près de 300 000 Canadiens qui avaient un emploi au début de la pandémie se cherchent toujours du travail. D'autres Canadiens pourraient perdre leur emploi en raison des confinements imposés ce mois-ci. Au-delà de toutes les autres leçons, la COVID nous a appris que nous sommes tous dans le même bateau. Notre pays ne peut pas prospérer si nous laissons derrière nous des centaines de milliers de, Canad de, milliers de Canadiens. The world has learned the lesson of 2009, the cost of allowing economic hardship to fester. In some countries, democracy itself has been threatened by that mistake. We will not let that happen in Canada. This budget will create, in total, nearly 500,000 new work and job opportunities for Canadians. We're going to hit our target of adding 1 million new jobs by the end of this year. Second, this budget makes a historic investment in early learning and childcare. After 50 years of talking about it and fighting for it, we're finally going to get it done. This is an investment of $30 billion dollars over five years, reaching $8.3 billion dollars annually in permanent spending. Our goal is that within five years, 
families everywhere in Canada should have access to high-quality daycare for an average of $10 a day. One of the most striking aspects of the pandemic has been the historic sacrifice young Canadians have made to protect their parents and grandparents. Our youth have paid a high price to keep the rest of us safe. We will not allow them to become a lost generation. So we will invest $5.7 billion over five years in Canada's youth. We will double the Canada Student Grant for two more years. We will extend the waiver of interest payments on federal student loans through March 2023. More than 350,000 low-income student borrowers will get access to more generous repayment assistance. Les travailleurs à faible revenu au Canada travaillent plus fort que n'importe qui d'autre au pays pour un salaire moindre. Au cours de la dernière année, ils ont subi des risques d'infection importants et des mis à pied. Plusieurs vivent sur le seuil de pauvreté, même s'ils travaillent à temps plein. Nous proposons d'élargir l'allocation canadienne pour les travailleurs et d'investir 8,9 milliards de dollars sur six ans en soutien supplémentaire aux travailleurs à faible revenu, ce qui permettra d'offrir un complément salarial à environ un million de Canadiens supplémentaires et sortira près de 100 000 personnes de la pauvreté. De plus, le présent budget instaurera un salaire horaire minimal fédéral de 15 dollars. Small businesses are the heart of our economy, and they have been hit very hard by lockdowns, including right now. To help the hardest hit businesses pivot back to growth, we propose a new Canada Recovery Hiring Program, which will run from June to November and will provide $595 million to make it easier for businesses to hire back laid off workers or bring on new ones. We will invest up to four billion dollars to help up to 160,000 small and medium-sized businesses buy and adopt the new technologies they need to grow. And we will encourage businesses to invest in themselves by allowing the immediate expensing of up to $1.5 million of eligible investments by Canadian-controlled private corporations in each of the next three years. Enfin, nous accordons un soutien ciblé aux industries qui ont été le plus durement touchées, soit les secteurs de l'hôtellerie, du tourisme, de la culture et de l'aérospatiale. We promised last November to invest up to $100 billion over three years to get Canada back to work and to ensure that the lives and prospects of Canadians are not permanently stunted by the COVID recession. That's what we're doing. We're doing this within a fiscal envelope that is prudent and responsible, with the debt to GDP ratio falling to 49.2% by 2025-26, and the deficit falling to 1.1% of GDP. Last fall, we projected a deficit for 2020-2021 of $381.6 billion. Our actual deficit will be $354.2 billion, below forecast. This budget is a smart, responsible, ambitious plan for jobs and growth that is designed precisely to heal the specific wounds of the COVID recession and to permanently strengthen Canada's economic muscle. Now, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Operator, we'll now take the first question. Operator, on prend maintenant la première question. Thank you. Please press star one at this time. For, if you have a question, s'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile l'un maintenant pour poser une question. La première question. The first question is from Steve Chase, Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. 
Hi. Good afternoon, Minister. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Steve. Good afternoon. My first question, and I assume I get a follow-up, is you say in the budget that with current low interest rates, these spending announcements are affordable and that it would be short-sighted not to make them. What's your response to those who say these low interest rates may rise sooner than you think, leaving the government and future generations with much higher debt costs? Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. So let me offer two answers. Um, first of all, we have a very prudent debt, managing strat debt management strategy, and we have been moving our debt into longer maturities. Before the pandemic, 15% of the bonds issued by the government were issued at maturities of 10 years or greater. In 2020, government allocations of long bonds rose to almost 29%. In this budget, we are proposing to increase that proportion to over 42%. That is going to lead us to have the longest average term to maturity in four decades. So part one of the answer is we understand that interest rates are historically low today. And we're taking advantage of that for Canadians by locking in more of our debt at longer maturities at these low rates. But the second part of my answer, Steve, is I really believe that the greater danger today is not to invest in a strong recovery from the COVID recession and not to invest in stronger, more robust long-term growth for Canada. We saw in 2009 that a prolonged economic recovery, a recovery where a lot of people don't get back to work for a long time, causes real pain and hardship and really hurts the economic potential of the country. It took Canada 10 years to fully recover when it comes to labor force participation from 2009. For me, the fact that we are about more than 450,000 jobs short of where we need to be to be at pre-pandemic employment levels is an urgent problem for Canada, and we need to invest now to get those jobs back quickly. And I would also say the best way to pay our debts back is to invest in long-term growth. The best way is to have a Canadian economy which is growing vigorously and robustly. And that is what this budget is designed to do. Thank you. Follow-up? And Yes, uh, on direct supports, why does the government believe that businesses and individuals will be in a secure enough position for the government to start phasing out the direct supports before the vaccination campaign is complete at the end of September? Could you give us an idea of what evidence backs this decision? Uh, thank you for the question, Steve. So... I think it's very important to note that we have extended the business and income supports, the wage subsidy, the rent subsidy, the lockdown support, and the CRB to September 25th. We have put in place a new hiring credit, which will run from June through November. And the enhanced EI is going to be available for an additional year. So we believe that Canadian businesses and Canadian individuals are going to need continued support while we continue to fight COVID. And we want to give them support as we move into a fully fledged recovery. Now, we have also, uh, we are also very aware that this virus has proven to be incredibly unpredictable. And no one knows for sure what the course of the virus and new variants will be. 
And that is why we are prepared to act further and to further extend the supports should the course of the virus recover, uh, should the course of the virus require that. Next question, prochaine question. Thank you. The next question, la question suivante, est de Laurence, Laurence Martin, Radio-Canada. La parole est à vous. Et bonjour, Mme Freeland. Euh, sur euh, la question des garderies, vous dites que le Québec aura droit à des compensations, mais est-ce que le Québec va recevoir l'équivalent de l'argent donné aux autres provinces là, pour leur programme de garderie? Est-ce que ce sera exactement euh, la même enveloppe au prorata de la population, évidemment? Et est-ce que cette enveloppe devra être exclusivement euh, dépensée pour les garderies? Ou est-ce que le gouvernement du Québec pourra faire ce qu'il veut avec cet argent-là? Euh, merci pour la question. Et en ce qui concerne les garderies, euh, je voudrais commencer en vraiment, vraiment remercier le Québec pour le leadership et surtout les féministes du Québec euh, pour les, le leadership en ce qui concerne les garderies. Euh, le Québec vraiment a donné un excellent exemple pour le reste du Canada. Le Québec a démontré que c'est possible. Et le Québec a démontré que l'impact économique de ce programme est excellent. Alors, euh, premièrement, merci à Québec. Le reste du Canada va suivre l'exemple du Québec. Euh, et évidemment, ce programme va absolument aider le Québec à... Euh, et je pense que c'est une bonne chose pour le Québec. Le Québec a un excellent système de garderie, mais ça coûte très cher. Et pour la première fois, le fédéral sera là pour vraiment aider le Québec à maintenir et à élargir ce système. Concernant les détails de l'accord bilatéral entre le Canada et le Québec, on doit parler, on doit discuter, mais je veux assurer le Québec et les Québécois et les Québécoises que ce programme va absolument aider, appuyer le Québec, euh, aider le Québec en, à élargir ce programme déjà excellent. Ma deuxième question euh, porte sur euh, les, le versement de 500 dollars aux aînés qui est prévu au mois d'août. Euh, que vous répondez aux gens qui voient ça comme une manœuvre électoraliste, qui disent euh, « on sent que le gouvernement fédéral, fédéral veut donner des chèques alors que des élections s'en viennent ». Pourquoi ne pas, pas avoir agi plus tôt sur les versements mensuels que vous comptez faire à compter de 2022? Pourquoi pas avoir commencé les versements mensuels en 2021? Nos aînés ont souffrir beaucoup à cause de covid et ils ont fait beaucoup pour notre pays, pour tout le Canada. Ils méritent l'aide qu'on va leur donner dans ce budget. Ils méritent l'amélioration qu'on va faire euh, avec euh, l'aide aux gens qui ont 75 ans et plus. Uh, concernant le fait qu'on va donner de l'aide immédiatement, c'est absolument nécessaire. Uh, nos aînés vraiment, vraiment ont vécu une année très, très difficile, un isolement difficile et cette aide est pour leur aider à vraiment participer dans la vie de notre pays quand on va avoir une relance de notre économie. Merci. Prochaine question. Merci. La question suivante, the next question is from Kevin Gallagher, CTV National News. Your line is open. Hello, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, Why do you need to spend all this $100 billion set, uh, set aside for stimulus when in your own budget the forecast uh, is actually for stronger economic growth than expected, a whole percentage point, in fact? We're spending... 
Yeah, are you finished your question, Kevin? Sorry. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, Kevin, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, the $101 billion our government will spend over three years is going to be spent to do three things. First of all, we have to finish the fight against COVID, and that costs a lot of money. Extending these income and business support programs is absolutely essential, and it is expensive. But we know the country needs it, and we know that the income and business support programs that have been in place since the beginning of the virus have done their job. They have prevented, largely prevented economic scarring, and they are one of the reasons that, as you point out, Kevin, the Canadian economy is already doing better than people forecast. So a big part of the job of the $100 billion, about $30 billion of that money, is to finish the fight against COVID. And, you know, we said to Canadians we would do whatever it takes. We will. That is absolutely essential. Part two is to recover from the COVID recession. And our particular focus is on jobs and on getting those jobs back. We are still, we still today have about 460,000 missing jobs relative to where we were before the pandemic. That is a lot of human tragedies. And we believe it is absolutely essential to act quickly to get those jobs back. That is what this budget is going to do. This budget is going to put us on a path to do as we promised to do it in the speech from the throne, which is to have 1 million jobs created in Canada by the end of the year. This job, this budget is going to create 500,000 training and work experience opportunities. From our government's perspective, the fact that hundreds of thousands of Canadians who want a job can't get one today is an urgent issue, and we are acting with the appropriate urgency to get them back to work. And job three of this budget is we really believe that Canada has the potential to grow more robustly and that we need to grow more robustly. And that is why we are making investments that will improve our growth for the long term. Early learning and child care is one example. This is social infrastructure that has the potential to alter Canada's growth trajectory in the same way that NAFTA did. This could permanently raise our GDP by 1.2%. But it's expensive. It's an investment worth making. The same goes for our investment in the green transformation. I really think that when people look back on 2021, they're going to say this is the year when the world pivoted to a green economy. And Canada has to be there. We have to be in the lead of that transformation. And that's where our government is investing money to do that too. Thank you. For my follow-up, um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, how this pandemic has uh, hurt the economy, but specifically for women. The she session, if you will. Now, this she session is mentioned three times in the budget, um, but I'm wondering what other measures there are outside of this large child care promise that's designed to help women in the workforce. Um, thanks for the question, Kevin. And let me first of all say, this investment in early learning and child care is historic. We know that early learning and child care is expensive if you do it right. And we're putting our money where our mouth is here. We're investing $30 billion over five years. This is going to be a transformational social investment and a transformational economic investment. Now, some people said to me when we were uh, in the Ministry of Finance working on this budget, um, they said, well, you know, you shouldn't really see this as an investment that is particularly about women. It's about all parents. And of course, I agree. 
It's about all parents, and it's about all children. But as a working mother, let me tell you, the reality for every working mother is the sad reality. Most women end up bearing the brunt of the child care work. And when things get tough, when child care disappears, as has happened during COVID, it ends up being women who leave their jobs. And that is the statistical reality we have seen. So the investment in early learning and child care, in building an early learning and child care system, this is going to be an enduring investment in making it possible for parents and especially women to participate in the labor force. And we have seen that that yields a great great economic dividend, and we don't have to look far to see how great that payoff is. We just need to look at how wonderful this program has been for Quebec. So I really do not want to understate either the complexity and the difficulty of building early learning and child care, nor to understate how transformational this will be for women for all parents, for children, and for the Canadian economy. So that's part one. Part two, we do have some specific investments in women's entrepreneurship, in our women's entrepreneurship initiatives, and those will make a big difference. Three, women, we have a lot of support in this budget for low-wage workers, and that will help women too. Women if you look, you know, there's a real intersection of women, youth, and low-wage workers. And a young, low-wage working mother has probably been among the hardest-hit people in this pandemic. So our investments in low-wage workers will help w- working women a lot as well. And then finally, a lot of women own small businesses. And we are making historic investments in small businesses in helping them buy and adopt and use new technologies to become more productive and more efficient. Canada's women entrepreneurs are going to benefit hugely from that. Merci. Prochaine question. Next question. Thank you. The next question, la question suivante, est de Lina Dib. Excusez-moi, de Lina Dib, euh, la presse canadienne. Euh, Madame la parole est à vous. Merci. Madame Freeland, euh, bonjour. Euh, je voudrais revenir sur les garderies. Euh, si j'ai bien compris votre réponse à ma collègue euh, de Radio-Canada, vous êtes en train de dire que cet argent devra forcément, quand on aura décidé de combien, euh, à combien s'élève la somme, l'argent devra forcément être dépensé dans les garderies au Québec pour que le Québec ait sa part. Euh, je voudrais juste que vous me clarifiez si j'ai bien compris. Et puis, dans votre budget, vous parlez de la nécessité de valoriser le travail des éducatrices du fait qu'elles ne sont pas assez payées. Je me demandais comment vous avez l'intention de euh, régler ce problème-là, étant donné que vous n'allez pas vous embaucher euh, des éducatrices dans les, les éventuelles garderies. OK. Uh, merci. Uh, bonjour, Lina. Uh, et uh, merci pour la question. Um, concernant le programme des garderies et le Québec et vraiment tous les provinces et territoires. Um, maintenant, le fédéral a dit une chose importante. Et c'est qu'on est prêt à soutenir les garderies autour du Canada avec beaucoup d'argent. Parce qu'on sait que c'est de l'infrastructure sociale qui est nécessaire et on sait que avoir les garderies c'est très important pour la croissance économique. Maintenant, on doit avoir des discussions bilatérales avec les provinces pour mieux comprendre qu'est-ce que chaque province veut, du quoi chaque province et territoire a besoin. On a déjà commencé en général, de discuter avec les provinces et territoires. Et je veux assurer les Québécois et les Québécoises que ce sera un excellent programme pour le Québec. Québec fait des choses excellentes en ce qui concerne les garderies, mais ça coûte très cher. Et 
pour 20 ans, le Québec l'a fait du seul. Maintenant, le fédéral sera là pour aider le Québec, pour aider à l'expansion des garderies. En ce qui concerne les détails, on doit le discuter. On doit savoir et comprendre de quoi le Québec en particulier a besoin. Mais je dois dire que euh, j'espère et je pense que les discussions entre le fédéral et le Québec seront les discussions les plus faciles de toutes les discussions avec les provinces et territoires qu'on aura, parce que le Québec déjà a un système excellent. Le Québec comprend très, très bien ce que le Québec a besoin. Et on sera très heureux d'écouter le Québec et de donner au Québec de l'aide pour ce que le Québec pense est nécessaire. Et, OK, je peux, je peux relancer. Excusez-moi, je pensais qu'on allait me demander. Donc, vous ne me répondez pas au sujet des salaires. Euh, si vous pouviez essayer de, de m'expliquer ça pour ma deuxième, en réponse à ma deuxième question. Euh, mais ce que je voulais vous demander en deuxième question, c'est que ce budget-ci, ça devait être le budget de l'après, de l'après-pandémie. Puis là, vous vous retrouvez à dépenser à peu près le tiers du nouvel argent euh, pour le, prolonge, le prolongement de programmes qui sont en lien avec la pandémie. Fait que je voudrais savoir... Qu'est-ce que vous auriez vous, qu'est-ce que vous, vous auriez voulu voir dans ce budget que vous n'avez pas pu y mettre parce que la troisième vague est là? Parce que ce budget, finalement, il n'est pas exactement ce que vous espériez, je suppose, euh, quand, vous, quand il y a eu le discours du trône euh, de l'automne dernier. OK. Uh, uh, merci, Lina. Uh, et vous avez uh, raison. Uh, uh, concernant uh, les salaires, uh, pour nous, c'est un élément important et la qualité des garderies est un élément important et ces deux choses sont très liées. Um, nous avons besoin des gens professionnels qui travaillent dans les garderies et on doit comprendre que euh, on a besoin d'un système de garderies et d'éducation de nos Canadiens et Canadiennes les plus jeunes. Et si on a des garderies d'autres qualités, s'ajoutera aussi à la qualité d'éducation de tous nos enfants. Et en 20 ans, on aura un effet économique de cette éducation excellente des premières années de la vie. Mais pour avoir ça, on doit vraiment créer une carrière pour les gens, surtout les femmes, qui travaillent dans les garderies. Euh, et je pense que l'expérience du Québec démontre ça, démontre l'importance de la qualité, démontre l'importance de vraiment avoir des gens bien qualifiés, bien payés qui travaillent là. Euh, mais on comprend que ça coûte cher et c'est un des éléments euh, qu'on va discuter avec les provinces et territoires. Um, ah, Lina, l'autre question que vous m'avez posée, c'est une question très difficile um, parce que chaque ministre du Finance, chaque politicien, je pense, doit être ambitieuse, doit être beaucoup de rêves pour le pays. Et même dans ce budget, évidemment, um, on a encore des choses qu'on uh, veut faire et qu espère, euh, que j'espère qu'on pourra faire dans l'avenir. Alors, notre travail, évidemment, n'est pas fini avec ce budget. Mais je dois aussi dire que je veux assurer les Canadiens que c'est un budget qui va faire le job. C'est un budget qui va vraiment aider nous tous à avoir des emplois, de croissance économique duquel nous avons besoin. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. The question suivante. The next question is from Julie Gordon Reuters. Your line is open. Hi there, Minister Freeland. Thanks so much for taking our questions today. 
Um, I'm, I'm just wondering about the measures on housing. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, recently about just how overheated things are looking. Um, in terms of this budget, we're seeing uh, some more details on one previously announced uh, tax, but really, really nothing else to kind of tamp down that demand. Um, can you sort of explain that decision as to why you didn't uh, go a little further in tackling this? Um, uh, sure, Julie, and thank you for the question. Um, on housing, as you said, um, we have announced that we're going to go ahead with a tax measure, and that is a tax on non-resident, non-Canadian vacant property. Uh, the idea here is that homes are for Canadians to live in. Uh, they are not assets for parking offshore money. And so this tax measure will work to ensure that that is the case. Uh, the budget also includes significant investments in housing because our view is that Canada is a growing country. Uh, part of our housing challenge is that as a growing country, we need to continue to build more housing. It's a good challenge to have. It is great that Canada is a growing country, but we believe that it is really important to be investing in housing, including affordable housing, and this budget does that. As you know, before the budget, OSFI announced a consultation, and we are following that very, very closely as well. Right. I mean, on that, that last thing you mentioned there with OSFI, I think it's up to finance to sort of change the rules on on the uh, insured side of uh, the mortgage scheme. I mean, is that something you're looking at? We didn't see any measures on that in this budget either. That's right. And when OSFI announced their consultation, we said we were following that closely. The consultation period is not up yet. Thank you. Last question. Dernière question. Thank you. La dernière question, the last question, is from Victoria Gibson, Toronto Star. Your line is open. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. I want to ask about housing as well here, uh, specifically the Rapid Housing Initiative extension. Your government uh, boosted the funding here to $1.5 billion, but I see no mention in this budget of changes that municipalities had been asking for. Uh, Peel Region had been struggling with using modular construction for smaller projects. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities had asked you for the ability to use stick-built construction instead of being limited to one form of new build. Uh, and there was a desire in Toronto to use future rounds of this funding for rooming houses. So I'm wondering why we're not seeing any of those commitments to adjusting the program if it's being extended with even more money. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria, for the question. Uh, the Rapid Housing Initiative has been one of our most successful and most popular programs, uh, and that is why we are extending it. We think that it has uh, been doing a really good job, and as we heard from you and from the previous question, there is a really urgent need for affordable housing, and so we are investing in that space. I would also point you to a new initiative where we are putting $300 million towards converting unused downtown office space to housing. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, we are seeing some unused office space appearing in our downtowns, and we think this is a great opportunity to do some more work on housing. When it comes to municipalities, let me remind everyone that uh, just last month, uh, we put forward an additional $2.2 billion uh, from our community building fund to municipalities to help them get through this final push on COVID. So we understand that they need support, and we've put some additional support there. Okay, and uh, my follow-up on the same program, actually. Um, the local governments have raised concerns about uh, the requirement to finish any of these funded projects within 12 months, uh, saying, you know, some saying they don't have enough runway to consult with the public or book contractors. 
uh, in places like Toronto and Peel and other municipalities, uh, they've asked you for more flexibility if this program was going to be extended. Uh, but I see from the budget that the 12-month deadline is going to remain in place with the second round, and I'd like to know why that is. Um, uh, thanks again, Victoria. Look, um, we are always happy to talk to Canada's municipalities, and uh, all of our ministers uh, have... Uh, very good lines of communication with Canada's mayors, um, very much including Ahmed Hussein, the responsible minister. I will say, though, um, part of the point of the Rapid Housing Initiative is for it to do what the name says. Um, we really believe it's important to get some housing created quickly. And that's what this program has been designed to do. 